Hello and welcome everyone to this uh, amazing session at Anankes Women in Literature Festival. This is our headlining session and I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome my amazing and distinguished guests. But first, a little bit about this session. Um, the session is titled Rediscovering Feminisms, which envisions to explore, interpret, understand, as well as acknowledge the existence of a diverse range of feminisms which are equally valid. This is perhaps an attempt at undoing some of the errors of older privileged dominant caste and class feminists who chose to speak or write for everyone and subsume diverse experiences in their own, hence ending up rendering them invisible. This session will also explore the now oftentimes asked question, is mainstream feminism overlooking other women and why so? What is privilege and its impact on feminism and the cause of gender equality? And most importantly, the discussion will focus on globalization and the notion of importing Western feminism. So welcome everyone. And I'd like to take this moment to specially thank Arpita who helped me conceptualize this session. Now, a little bit about my esteemed panelists, and I'll start alphabetically. Arpita Das is the founder and publisher of the award-winning indie publishing house based in New Delhi, India, Yoda Press. She's also senior writing fellow and visiting faculty at Ashoka University and a board member of Publish Her. Arshia Sattar has a PhD from the Department of South Asian Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. Arshia works with Hindu myth and epic and the story, tra the story traditions of the subcontinent. Arshia co-founded and runs the Sangam House International Writers Residency in Bangalore, which hosts writers from India and countries across the world in a safe and nurturing environment. Naima Rashid is an author, poet, and literary translator. Her first book was Defiance of the Rose, a translation of selected verses by late Urdu poet Praveen Shakir. Her forthcoming works include a joint translation of Zizani's by Clara Shulman with other translators, as well as her own fiction and poetry. Um, sorry. And Nola Ki Koti by Ali Akbar Natik, as well as her own fiction and poetry. She's a member of the UK-based translation collective, Shadow Heroes, which teaches young people to embrace all sides of their heritage through translation workshops across different languages. She has previously taught French as a foreign language and French literature at linguist linguistic wings of the French consulates in Lahore and Jada and at Kanade College Lahore. Nilanjana Bhumik is the co-editor of the Gender and Development Journal. She's a, a multi-award winning journalist, editor, writing coach, media mentor, and strategist, and a gender equality and safe workplaces advocate whose writing focuses on gender through the intersectional lens. Her work on gender and social justice has been awarded by the European Commission and the Institute of Development Studies in the UK. She was featured by the National Geographic magazine in their iconic 2019 Women of Impact issue and is the author of a soon to be published book, The Lies Our Mothers Told Us, that examines gender inequalities inside India's middle class homes. Sasha A. Akhtar is an ACE supported writer, translator, and educator over a span of 20 years. She has published six poetry collections and a collection of short fiction set in Pakistan entitled Of Necessity and Wanting. Akhtar has the distinction of being one of a handful of Pakistani women writing in English to be published in the experimental stream of UK poetry. A poetry school London tutor, her work is widely an anthologized and has been translated in to Armenian, Portuguese, Gaelican, Russian, Dutch, and Polish. Her, tra her translations of the work of writer Hijab Imtiaz, the first female pilot in the subcontinent, will be published by Oxford University mm -hmm. Press India in July 22. So welcome everyone. All right, so I'll begin with uh, the basics and 
you know, uh, let's talk about our conversation about cultural diversity, a woman's um, cultural diversity. There are many aspects to one's identity from race, from religion, belonging to different cultures, diff different ethnic groups, gender, and so on. So, and, and if we take, take a look at the developmental sector, development sector, the problem or the challenge claimed is that working with vulnerable groups or marginalized groups, you know, stakeholders and NGOs focus on maybe one or two aspects of identity. And this makes me go back to what I had initially just read about acknowledging the existence of diversity and plurality. Why do we need to have, uh, why, why do we need to approach challenges when it comes to gender and equality and yes, feminism through an intersectional lens? Um, should we go alphabetically, Arpita? Oh gosh, I always, why don't you go reverse alphabetically? Because okay. I, okay. I'd, I'd love to hear from Nilanjana about this because I've actually read a lot of what she has had to write and, you know, kind of say about this. And so I was just wondering, you know, Nilanjana, I mean, if I may suggest. <laughs> <laughs> that was very well done, Arpita. Thank you so much. Oh, come on. Come but, on. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, um, I was going through the talking points that you sent, Sabin, and um, there was a question that you asked there that, you know, do we need, you know, do we need to look at women's niche from, uh, uh, you know, from the perspective of cultural diversity, or should we consider women as one single group? Um. If I talk, you know, like from my experience of working, you know, on the ground in India, I would say that, you know, there are, um, you know, there is no single group as such, you know, you can't really put women as a single group because there is, um, so their realities are so varied and, you know, it is not just about being poor or underprivileged, but even among, you know, privileged women, um, there is a lot of difference between um, what I call, you know, intellectual empowerment. So I think, you know, when we are talking about um, feminism or when we are talking about women's needs, I mean, like, I mean, you know, feminism is just one part of, you know, like what a woman needs, you know, to be empowered, right? Um, when we talk about education, you know, we are, we are obviously, you know, talking about, you know, poor women's, you know, education, you know, access to education, to social benefits. Uh, when you look at women's needs from that perspective, then if you uh, if you think about the India experience, I mean, can you really compare the experience of, say, for example, a Dalit woman with someone, you know, like who belongs to the upper caste? The, the, the sheer amount of privilege, you know, um, you know, will not allow, you know, what laws you make for uh, women's laws, basically, you know, I mean, it doesn't apply to everybody. I was just reading this uh, report, you know, by the, by a Dalit, you know, human rights group, uh, just today, actually, I'd say that um, the, the National Crime Records Bureau, um, you know, if you, if you look at the national uh, reports by the National Crime Records Bureau, you'd see that there is an alternate increase, you know, in um, sexual violence or violence against women in alternate years, you know, for women across the board. But when it comes to Dalit women, the, uh, the increase is steady every year. So every year it increases. So, you know, no, I mean, I don't think, you know, you can consider women as a single group nowhere in the world. You know, even if you um, talk globally, you know, the issue, there, there's, you know, the, there's the issue of caste and class in India. There's the issue of race, um, you know, like globally. So I don't think, you know, like, um, you know, we have to take into consideration, we have to customize what we are um, doing for women or what we want to do for women, how we are, um, you know, trying to empower them. It has to be a customized set of solutions targeted at specific groups of women. Um, yeah, I mean, I if uh, you can hear me, right? If I can just sort of jump in there. Also, I can, obviously I completely agree. And what's very interesting is that in the last, let's say five years in the, let's talking globally, there has been this huge and wonderful 
pushback against this sort of top-down feminism, which has come through globalization, through uh, the rise of mass media, where there's, you know, one voice speaking for all women and, uh, you know, sort of uh, coming to its apex in this wonderful book against white feminism by a girl from Karachi, you know, Rafia Zakaria, who sort of exemplifies in many ways the same kind of experience of an underprivileged oppressed woman because she was married off sent to america brutalized ended up in a homeless shelter so there's definitely been this greater awareness and i think that what you're saying about the customization is so important and it relates also to development models rather than this top-down model it's like this grassroots model you know with community organizations but if we can look at that on like a global scale where each community has its own specific feminisms um so yeah i just wanted to jump in with that if anybody else now wants to come in. i think I'm you know what to... you're, uh, sorry, sorry i'm just going to add a very small point i think you know like um what um you just you know uh we're saying you know i think you know that's like uh liberal feminism has sort of you know boxed feminism as an um you know it 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 wants to you know stay in line with patriarchy you know like so you know there is a lot of this discourse you know we we here in india where you know uh, women are always encouraged to um fit into spaces that are, that are essentially spaces that are made for men for example work places you know if you if you if you look at the period uh, debate in india for example you know i mean um uh, women are always being uh, asked to fit into workplaces public spaces that are basically built for men i don't think you know uh, women need to fit into male spaces they need to demand for you know like spaces to to uh, to cater to their differential needs so i think you know liberal feminism has i was reading this book you know uh, called the uh, feminism for the 99 person and they make a very valid point that you know um we don't i mean a liberal feminism you know like uh, boxes us into this you know like this um uh, sort of a way that you know you have to you know like to to move ahead you know to break the glass ceiling you have to fit in you have to be one of the boys so to say but you know that's, that's that's not the way you know and I, I i love saying this that you know i mean you know you you i mean we are all ready to you know bring our own chairs you know to the table but maybe you know it's time to you know bring a new table all together yeah um nilanjana are you suggesting that illiberal feminism does not box women into patriarchal spaces or male spaces that already exist i i in that you know with a uh, liberal feminism what and this is my personal opinion you know there is too much um stress on the individual you know my the interest is actually in illiberal feminism because i consider <laughs> myself a liberal feminist so i think i know its parameters what is illiberal feminism I, um, i don't think you know like we can really divide you know like it that way you know it's not you know as black and white as liberal and illiberal feminism but i think you know like there are different kinds of feminism and i think you know it's time for us to you know understand there is a need for all kinds of feminism that you know there cannot be just one kind like like say for example you know a very you know like a like a small example like say for example you know for someone like me you know i come from a privileged background for me to you know like to do a lot of things is much easier you know for me to go and you know um say for example you know stand my ground you know in a in a male dominated space you know it's much more easier because you know yeah i'll lose a job i've lost many jobs in the past but you know i have again you know like gotten back on my feet but you know like for a lot of women that i work with it's actually not easy if they are pushed out of a workplace it means they are pushed back inside the their homes you know inside you know the kitchen so they are like um, you know pushed back into again into reproductive labor so i think you know like mm -hmm. and um, you know as 
my book you know like looks at uh, feminism for middle class women you know why you know we have lost you know like it's it's a, it's a huge group you know in india it's an expanding group but you know mm -hmm. there there's we they have stayed out of the ambit of feminism and you know i look at you know like why that is because they have education you know um it's not like they're not aware of feminism but you know they still you know uh, you know like to stay within the ambits of patriarchy it's it's probably you know they feel that you know it's a price they have to pay for you know whatever you know like a uh, gratuitous freedom they has they have been um um uh, allowed uh, by that patriarchal system. So I'm just saying that, you know, I don't think we can, um, uh, you know, just define uh, feminism as liberal and illiberal feminism, but we need to, you know, just open it up, you know, for uh, for various other kinds of feminism. And I think, you know, like, um, you know, in a platform like this, you know, it's so great that, you know, we can talk about, you know, our, uh, you know, what our thoughts are about the different forms of feminism that is possible because nobody's experience is the same right so you know i think you know femini feminism should be defined by you know it should also be customized to a, a a woman's or a group of women's you know lived experience i don't think i answered your question though Not really, but it's okay. <laughs> naima you uh... yeah i was just i picked up on something very interesting uh nilanjana am i pronouncing your name correctly yes yes absolutely uh nilanjana you made this connection uh, between privilege and feminism and i would just like to alert all of us to the deceptiveness of that perception because privilege does not always mean uh, absence of oppression it does not always mean enablement because we have between uh you know the home and society we have a mental construct of mindset and a lot of people a lot of women uh, they come from very privileged backgrounds or they live in very privileged uh, situations but they do not have access to opportunities because of mindset issues and they spend lifetimes trying to break free of that uh, the second point that i was um, i'd like to point out is we were just talking about you know liberal and illiberal feminisms and i would just like to say that as long as we are um mapping the territory this vast territory of women their rights their possibilities the opportunities open to them as long as we are stuck in the the need to define black and white categories we are limiting ourselves i think being a slave to defining categories um we need a different approach we need an approach that that completely embraces the diversity and the fact that there is no one size fits all solution there's so much diversity there's so much uh, there's so much beauty in it that it's got to be embraced at a completely different level altogether and perhaps as you right, rightly pointed out instead of bringing chairs to tables which are set up by men maybe we can build a whole other room maybe we can build a whole other building and bring new tables and similarly maybe we can just break down these categories and define new ones i would like to just you know add something to your first point about privilege see that that's exactly what i said you know if you look at the middle class women in india you know they are a privileged group they have the privilege of education they have you know like they are aware of feminism that's why i said you know when i'm talking about privilege privilege is out of different um you know like um different forms you know it could be intellectual empowerment it could be um it could be wealth it could be you know um i, I mean you know there are so many different kinds so you know like if you look at the uh, you know middle class women in india they they are also privileged women but you know they are still they cannot they do not have access to feminism or they they are untouched they have largely remained untouched by feminism and we actually do not know i mean we can we can hazard a lot of guesses but we actually do not know why they have remained untouched by feminism you know why are they still you know uh, playing along with with patriarchy as i said we can hazard uh, a lot of guesses but i think you know it's time we actually look into you know uh, this you know um this 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 is different layers that why are certain women you know um why are not every women you know moving forward together why are some of them you know like still left behind despite their privilege despite access despite education i i would i just like to address that as well but i i just wondered if arpita i don't want to uh, <laughs> if you would like to speak first that's fine but with privilege and the lack of privilege uh it relates to what i was saying earlier and 
what uh, uh, Naima was saying, I believe it comes down to the level of oppression, which is the word is, uh, you know, the difference between the social justice issue of feminism and other issues is the level of oppression. And uh, for a lot of, you know, privileged women, like we're saying, why do they not have access? I feel like it comes down to the shackles of the mind, right? It's it's what's around you, like what Naima was saying about your environment and about, so I mean, in my, for example, my book of fictions, uh, I write mostly about, not about the upper classes, but the one woman who is, she's trapped in a, in a, in a patriarchal environment, which is uh, doubly uh, strengthened by economics and wealth and tradition. So who's to say, yes, she may not, she may have the trappings of wealth, but exactly who's to say that she's not more oppressed? I mean, of course, variations in oppressed, we can't really make comparisons. But ge gendered violence, gendered violence occurs at the top levels of wealth as well. So I feel like that gives us a hint as to why not every single woman or female can stand up and say, uh, you know, I want to <laughs> break the shackles of patriarchy because it's really not that simple. It's not. I find it. Uh, come in here. I've just been thinking of a couple of things as um, this really fantastic, you know, exchange has been happening. And I was thinking, first of all, in my mind, at least, the minute we think in terms of feminisms in plural, then we can't really think in, also think in terms of why has feminism not touched them? Because then you're thinking of one kind of feminism again, isn't it? Because it's then you're thinking of your kind of feminism not touching them. Perhaps they have their kind of feminism that you don't know anything about. That's the first thing. The second thing I've been thinking about is that, um, uh, uh, Nilanjana, you very uh, correctly mentioned intellectual empowerment, but when, I, when it comes to privileged women, I think financial empowerment goes hand in hand with that because while they might have a lot of wealth in terms of the family, who has the uh, agency to control the wealth? Yes. You know, we really don't know about that, right? Yeah. And that often stands in the way of those women ever really being able to take a decision on their own, uh, burdened as they are, but the whole, uh, the whole uh, you know, you, you carry the honor of the family on your shoulders, crap. Uh, like all women are in, particularly in South Asia, I suppose. Anyway, um, having said that, I was thinking actually, as you were speaking of the fact that um, I think Sasha mentioned the last five years, how things have, you know, we've seen this kind of, kind of paradigm shift. And I was thinking of that because I, I actually started teaching at university around 2013. And at that time, my... Um, uh, uh, whenever I do my classroom lectures, I'd only use the pronoun she. So even for the men, I would say she. It was just something I did because I was like, why not? And it was actually fantastic. The students loved it. Even the male students loved it. I've got to a point now where both at home with a 17-year-old uh, uh, queer identifying child and with many, many non-binary students, I have now made the decision to, by default, always refer to my students as they. Because, um, you know, even that, the, 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 that decision that I, I still stand behind, that I took in 2013, to use she all the time, I still stand behind my decision to do that then. But I realize it no longer flies, that the discussion has moved ahead so much, you know, um, that I have to uh, respect that. And I have to say, okay, here I was thinking I'm now 40, you know, here, uh, hitting 48. I know everything there is about diverse feminism, sit back and learn again. Because I was, you know, very close to the uh, LGBTQ movement in the 90s and 2000s, which were talking about how feminism needs to relearn how to deal with queer feminism. Now I find we're at another stage of relearning. And I think that's the thing, you know, that's the movement. And I mean, Arshia, Arshia is like iconic for me, right? I mean, she's kind of put so many things in rolling that I am sort of 
um, uh, bearing fruit. Be I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying the benefits of that because of what Arsha has done. And that's actually been the, that's been the, the sort of, I don't know, what can we call it? Cycle of feminism as well, in a sense, but that, that also means that we keep kind of learning and reinventing and respecting each other. Sorry, Asha. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I'm a little um, overwhelmed by your um, compliment, but thank you very much. I'm not sure I deserve it, but it's made me think of a couple of things. One thing I was thinking about even before um, uh, we started the panel um, was my experience in the last six months, most, specific, most strongly in the last six months, but obviously over many, many years, is um, two things. One is how younger um, women don't want to call themselves feminists. And this is before the explosion of LGBTQ, non-binary, you know, the, 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 the sort of spectrum of um, gender and sexuality that is now something, as you said, we all have to contend with um, and we have to learn from. And that has always upset me that younger feminists don't want to call themselves feminists, right? And I'm like, what, what's wrong with me? You don't want to be like me? Am I that terrible? But really what I mean is that there is no acknowledgement of the blood that has been shed, of the lives that have been lost, of the brutality that has been experienced, bones broken, faces shattered for centuries, you know? Um, and I, it, it, um, it's, it's hard to talk to younger feminists about this because you just sound like a, um, um, you sound a bit recalcitrant, you know? Like you're not really listening to them. It's like, I am listening to you, but are you listening to me? And I'm not hearing that. In the, in the gamut that we are now considering. So that was one thing. And the other thing also in the last six months, again, I've been teaching um, a course in um, Indian literature in translation, um, contemporary literature, which is you know, not what I usually do. And I wanted very, very much to teach uh, marginal writing. So Muslim women, Dalits, um, people who are writing out of non-urban environments, you will not believe the resistance, um, I think it's completely unconscious, that students have, right? Um, with um, not, of course they say, oh my God, this is terrible. Oh my God, how did this happen? Oh, no, no. But there is a real sense of, well, that is them and this is us, right? But in the course of reading these literatures over the last six months and also the work as I've been doing in the last 20 years. For me, the rediscovery of feminisms is not new feminisms, it's old feminisms. You know, how profoundly feminist women are. She was writing like, you know, nearly a hundred years ago, right? It's uh, Majukdai, what is this? If this is not, um, it's not for them, of course, for those two women in particular, yes, they are self-consciously feminist, right? The women who've been rewriting the Hindu epics forever, the women who are talking back to the Hindu epics in their songs, in their, you know, in their designs, in their pictures. And it's been happening for centuries, right? So the consciousness of feminism sometimes um, exists outside the label, even the label of feminism, right? And this is what I keep pointing out to my students is that, listen, she's not saying feminism. She's not using all the words that we, but what is she saying? She is asking for her rights. She is asking for empowerment. She is not going to take oppression. That is feminism, yeah? And if we have as, as simplistic a definition of feminine as that, then obviously there are multiple feminists. Yeah, they have to be, but it's when we keep piling on more and more qualifiers and more and more adjectives that our feminisms grow smaller and smaller, you know? But I really struggle with this thing that um, the new, um, God bless the non-binaries and, you know, the multi-gender people and whatever they want to call them themselves. And it is completely my privilege, as you are saying, Arpita, to call them over by what they want to be called, right? If you say your name is Pakwa, if your like gender adjective is Pakwa, please, of course I'm going to use that, right? But do not behave as if you came out of an egg. Yeah? 
you are able to do this because a vocabulary has been built for you, a scaffolding has been built for you, a platform has been built for you. And sadly, sadly, it's been built by women and gay people. Yeah, men are not in this, of course, I'm sorry, there are gay men, of course there are, but it's not, the patriarchy has not given this to you. It is us marginalized people, it's those of us who've been oppressed for so long, who have been shunned, who have been excluded from the center. We are the ones who provided the scaffolding, this platform, this, you know, this vocabulary, everything now. Sorry, not done. For the, for the moment, I'm only in that for the moment, yes. No, I I totally I hear this actually just to, I hear this I mean this there is this struggle going on between and I don't want to say old and new but just for the ease of speaking right now like for example even Kish, uh, Kishwar Nahid recently got into you know quite big trouble uh, <laughs> with the new feminist usne wo aurat march ke baare mein you know, she yeah. said some um what i don't understand is why the why why do we have to fight you know and i think things become a lot easier if we don't talk about gender and sexuality all this and we just talk about oppression so there are two classes oppressed and not oppressed so merely this has become a lot simpler and also it becomes you see one of the things that really annoy has annoyed me about what is being I'm using the word white feminism, even though I myself don't agree with this as a whole thing. But for the purposes of moving forward, I feel like we must undo the damage that was already done by this top-down approach of this one feminism fits all. And one of those things about that is like, for example, I'll tell you, I had a non-binary partner. Okay, I'll share this with you. So, uh, originally they were he and now they are he again so in this whole thing of you know I'm be becoming they and all this and uh, you know you are not we are not this we are not that but I turned around to him now he's a white American and I said what are you going to do you're going to go to like this Dalit woman for example in the village and you're going to say you know, who is the victim of gendered violence, specifically a female, and say, don't you know, sweetie, gender is a myth. So what are you going to explain? So they, I feel like, I feel like this, a third way, you know, we need this. And it's, but this constant battling is, what is the purpose of this? This is not going to help anybody. Abhi, dekho, even in the West, what's going on with the trans community, there are death threats between the trans communities. And all this J.K. Rowling, it, it, it is completely purposeless as far as I'm concerned, you know. And they co they, I myself, I, I appreciate who has come before me, like the history. They co Iqbal Unnisa Hussain Biti Usne Parda and Polygamy Likhata. And like you were saying, Aishya, you were mentioning the history of, of, of what has gone before us. This, it seems to be, seems to lack, yes. Yes, in the, in the social media generated instant. But uh, I feel like we could, you know, histories are important, where, how we have gotten to where we are. I, I appreciate the point. And I think a lot of the, even the gay, you know, the gay community, the gay men say this a lot, that the new gay men uh, don't appreciate where they've, what they've already done, you know, how they all died of AIDS, all that. I've heard this actually said a lot. So. Yeah. Um, if I may just, you know, provide a little bit of a counter, the fact is that, that the history is important. And I remember this time when at Kolkata uh, Book Fair, the Literary Fest, a young woman stood up and said, you know, the West has had a feminist movement for so long, and when are we going to have it in India? And I exploded. <laughs> yeah. And I said, I don't know what I said. I don't even remember what I said, you know, and I, they never called me after that. I must have, I short of using cuss words, I think I just went crazy. But given that, you know, all the same, I'll tell you another, I mean, I, I prefer to speak anecdotally. I think that speaks better than, you know, kind of, um, my author, Ghazala Jamil, who's written this fabulous book, Muslim Women Speak, when I was editing that was, uh, a real uh, learning curve for me because one of the things she mentions there when she's talking about her own, you know, sort of motivation to go out across pan India and speak to Muslim women of every milieu to write that book was that one of the things that happened to her was that she was, of course, some um, 
uh, scholarly seminar at JNU, and uh, you know there were mm, the well-known privileged feminists, you know, on the dais, um, and uh, were talking about uh, the feminism of everybody. Were choosing to talk about the feminism of everybody, and when she stood up, and this was more than ten years ago, and she stood up and talked about the fact that it's different being a Muslim woman because the atmosphere is changing. And now we know this, right? The Muslim is being targeted in India, right? So uh, she said that for me, it's very important to not immediately demonize the man in my family because there's a lot happening here where he too is a victim alongside me. Yeah. And you have to adapt your feminism to understanding that. The, uh, femi the feminist on the dais, talked down to her, shut her up, and said, and this is in her book, in her introduction, said that you're weakening the movement by talking like <laughs> so, And this has happened for decades. I mean, we know that, that you know, upper class, upper caste, uh, Hindu feminists largely have sat, uh, uh, you know, uh, frankly also upper class, I will also say upper caste Muslim feminists, Christian feminists, as you know, caste goes across all boundaries in this country, have sat in these positions of power for very long and have kind of acted as gatekeepers. And the fact is the younger uh, feminists or millennial feminists, I like to call them, uh, they are battling because why won't they battle if those people are acting as gatekeepers? And there will be a battle. And I think for me, the battle is not such a problem. You know, for me, it's like if something emerges out of it, even if it's some sort of understanding of, okay, after all the battling, can we work together? Then that would be more valuable, frankly. No, and this is what we say, that we don't know about the words of the people. So sometimes the words of the people don't have to be. I mean, whether you are talking about older feminists who oppress you with their dogma or their ideology, or you talk about patriarchy, or you know, learn, learn, ke sab kuch lena padta hai, yeah. Koi, you know, nobody is coming with presence, yeah. right? Hundred, hundred percent. I think you are not but uh, I just feel like the infighting is actually a result of. Uh, narratives of privilege and domination sort of winning rather than winning for the cause. So I agree. Learn not to part that. Naima? I think Naima was saying something. Arsha, I'd like to ask you to what do you attribute this disconnect that younger feminists have uh, with, you know, the, uh, for want of a better word, the older generation of feminists? It, why is this context missing in their understanding? Part of it is what Arpita was referring to, you know, people like myself who embody every kind of privilege you can imagine, except that now against my, against my grain, um, I have to say now that I'm a Muslim woman, not that I'm ashamed of being a Muslim woman, but how it actually impacts my privilege, right, mm. very immediately. Um, so I think possibly it's... Um, that older feminists gave the impression of not listening. So I think mm. it's partly that, but I do think it's also, um, it's not just about younger feminists and older feminists. I mean, I, I've been teaching cultural studies and history and all of that. And Naima, I am appalled. Indian students, don't know who Ambedkar is, you know, I mean, certain kind of Indian student, you know, certain privilege. In, so history in general is not an oh. active um, participant in a millennial's landscape or a younger person's landscape. So with all that, you know, specifically it bothers me about feminism, but it equally bothers me about history. So I think it just in general, there is, um, um, there's a, there's a, there's a sense of, oh, well, the world was created when I was born. Um, you know, so I think so, it's a part of that as well. Yeah. Sounds like my son. Deka, deka. So it's, it's, it's just there. And we are the, are the ones who have to 
really build the bridges because young people ain't building no bridges towards us, man, that's for sure. You know? <laughs> Maybe we occupy too much space. Maybe there are too many of us older people on the planet now and, uh, you know. Um, you know, it's really interesting listening to everyone and um, it reminds me uh, uh, of this book uh, I reviewed for Nilanjan actually. Um, uh, yeah. And, you know, um, Arshia, you're talking about Kurutula and Heather and uh, language. And, you know, reading that book, you know, uh, I sort of reflected that, you know, language itself, you know, it's, you know, the assumption it's that it's man-made, right? So the, you know, it's deeply entrenched with patriarchy. So in that scenario, and I've, I've jotted down my points, you know, when we say that, you know, women, there are women who are untouched, you know, rural women, they're untouched uh, by feminism, or they realize they don't know what feminism is. So how do we communicate that to them organically? Because now I'm coming to these campaigns and these protests and audit march and with this, uh, these placards. And, you know, the idea is, you know, Mera uh, Jisam Meri Marzi, which is a great slogan. I'm not saying that. But, you know, again, language and the positioning uh, of what you're saying in, in a culture uh, or in a society that is unequipped to handle that, if I, if I can say that, how do we communicate that so that, you know, uh, you empower society organically? And does it make sense? Yes. <laughs> Lots of thoughts. Um, Nilanjana, we'll go with you. No, I was just thinking, you know, when you were, uh, you know, uh, saying this, that I think, you know, every uh, woman, you know, is, uh, you know, they are all feminists. We are all feminists. It just depends on the degree of oppression that we face, the kind of, you know, circumstances, you know, we grew up in, um, the kind of, you know, and, um, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, if you grew up in a, in a rich family, you know, or you grow up in a, you know, it, the realities are different, but, you know, again, you know, it is the degree of oppression that you, that you face. So I think, you know, like, I don't think, you know, we um, need to take feminism to, to women as such. I mean, I think, you know, like they are, you know, it is in, in them. I think, you know, education, empowerment, you know, access to, you know, economic opportunities, especially economic opportunities, you know, it is you, um, you teach a woman how to read and write, go out to work every day, you will empower them, you know, and they will start, you know, like uh, thinking very differently. I have seen this, you know, like firsthand among, you know, women I have worked with, uh, women I have interviewed, you know, like for my book. And, um, the moment you know they are free from that oppression you know which is it's mostly you know like in patriarchal setups you know either either you know passed down through their fathers or, or husbands or whatever the moment they're free of that oppression they all are you know like they come from being you know i i hear this a lot you know and over the last few years a lot of women say there's too much feminism in our lives so now you know i am always um and then I have this silent battle with myself that, that, that do I take this on? Do I like, you know, but then I, then I realize that what is the point of an outburst on my part? Because, you know, she is obviously still not in that space uh, where she can um, appreciate what all has gone in all, or what all has gone down in history for her to be able to say that there is too much feminism in our lives and you know and the 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 woman that said this to me you know this uh this was like around three uh probably four or five years back and in that five years you know her life has you know gone uh through immense upheavals you know she had managed to you know like free herself you know like from you know a very abusive marriage and today 
she doesn't feel that there is too much feminism in our lives today you know she calls herself a feminist because you know she has come to that place organically so i think you know she is now working she is earning money she is living you know on her own terms she's taking for the first time she has taken a vacation on her own and now she feels free she feels like you know she she now she understands and appreciates you know what has you know that the history of you know like what has gone on you know for her to reach where she is today so i think you know um all of these these are important you know educational empowerment intellectual empowerment you know i mean um, when we talk about education i, I think in, in most countries in south asia education is just degrees it's not knowledge you know it's not empowerment so you know i think um um arpita would be knowing about this this uh, this man in india um he he used to be a village council um chief like a pradhan and um, he started this um this campaign called uh, selfie with daughter it's a very interesting story you know his name is sunil jaglan and you know he works in just one village and in that village he has done very small small things you know which are so key like he has built i'll just give one example um he has built a library where he has around 900 books by women for women with women protagonists and all the girls in that village have to go to that you know like library and read those books you know this sort of absolutely you know like you know grassroots kind of you know empowerment is so so important and you don't have to actually go with a campaign you know to to empower women you can just go with um, certain very targeted actions you know which are natural you know once you once a girl, you give a girl a book and if she likes that book she will pick up another book it's as simple as that right so i i think you know these are very 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 small steps you know i think you know we have to stop thinking in terms of big actions you know and we have to start thinking of very small actions you know going inside our homes you know looking at our homes you know where where the operation all starts at home right so we have to you know like look at small small actions would anyone like to add to that yeah i i mean i don't have children so i should really not be the person saying this but we got to deal with our sons oh yes absolutely you know, we have to make sure that our sons grow up to be absolutely uh, compassionate equality minded you know um yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and i think you know like that's something that brings a lot of hope i uh, my son is you know almost 17 and um i see his generation of course you know again you know um he goes to a very you know high end school you know he is privileged uh, you know like from you know like uh, from that point of view and obviously all his friends also come from you know similar you know privileged backgrounds but there is an understanding among these kids and the school plays a very important role and that school is absolutely gender neutral you know ch- um, uh, boys are you know taught to you know sew and cook and girls you know they have a you know gender neutral football team you know girls and boys play together and i think you know like um these are you know certain things and i see you know that they 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 are very different these children you know they don't think pink is for you know pink is for girls and blue you know blue is for boys they don't think in those terms anymore they don't think that you know uh, kicking a football around in the field is something that only boys can do or cycling you know like out in the public space is something only boys can do and these girls are also very different you know and, and i'm talking about 16 15 16 17 year olds they are they i think you know and, and they call themselves feminists with a lot of pride so i think you know there is a bit of hope in that generation you know i think they are called the i generation or something yeah. Yeah, <laughs> i think kind of guys ye se hote hote kahan pahunch gaye i'd love to add to that you know i mean that um i think this uh, if i, I that i've been very lucky perhaps i've taught both at ambedkar university and ashoka university which has very different kinds of students in a sense there is an overlap but there are also deep differences between the student communities in both universities uh, since 2013 as i said and i think these are people who are very proud to be feminist and wear it wear it on their sleeve uh, i have I mean, I was just as you were speaking, Nilanjana. I was thinking of uh, talking about 
uh, education and I was thinking one of the discussions, our most memorable classroom discussions from both Ashoka and Ambedkar that I remember is reading Mary Beard's uh, Women in Power Manifesto while discussing Rukhaya Shikabad Hussain's Sultana's Dream. You know, and everybody in, in the class, uh, those who identify as women, men, non-binary, everybody participated and was equally enthused by the texts, which was, I mean, these, memorable for me, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I have a lot of hope. I feel that as much as there are people who don't want to call themselves feminists among young people, I remember in my generation, uh, Ashir, yeah. approaching 50, there are so many women who don't want to call themselves feminists. And I, I was fighting with them. I had stopped yeah. getting invitations from all these friends. Right. I mean, so I think we've had that, you know, in different generations, women who, for whatever reason, have made a particular decision about their lives. Uh, after that, want to, you know, talk about humanism and they want to talk about family or whatever and uh, became uncomfortable talking about the F word as, as they call it. And, I, and yeah. I was always the odd one out in that situation. So for me, actually, I felt more at place with this younger lot, you know, mm. where uh, they get why I am uh, occupied with queer feminisms. They get why I'm occupied with trans folks and what's happening with them in my country. You know, my generation doesn't get it at all. Mm. They just think of them as the hijra who comes to the wedding, even today, mm. you know. So, um, yeah, sorry, got a little carried away, but yeah. Can I just say that uh, circling back to what Nilanjana just said uh, about you know or organically uh, uh, removing oppression and organically uh, changing our mindsets through small gestures, I think it's a very powerful approach because small gestures and the liberating power of small gestures can have a ripple effect, and it can if you ex extricate that from a context and bring it even to a middle class or a privileged uh, you know environment the simple expectation that it's not always mom who has to spend two hours cooking, you know, just, just releasing the burden of that, just releasing like when my son comes and he's like, I'm hungry, I'm gonna go and make a steak. I'm like, good, get one for me too. Just th th those small gestures are infinitely powerful. And uh, I mistrust campaigns and large scale movements. Uh, and I have my faith in the power of these small gestures. and focusing on intent and the sincerity of intent rather than the glamour of a campaign. And also personal integrity, you know, Naima, yeah, we have to live what we are teaching or preaching or hoping for. We really have to live that. And that is another kind of small gesture, no? That in our own lives, we don't make certain kinds of compromises. We don't use certain kinds of vocabulary. We, you know, perhaps, perhaps, even don't wear certain kinds of clothes, you know, mm. uh, because that's that's a real minefield, you know, who gets to tell a woman what to wear. And when a woman tells exactly. us what to wear, what is she actually saying? Where is it coming from? Asha, um, you're so right. That's the, actually, that is the hardest. Yeah, Living is. what you mm. are. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, what's the word? What you, what's the lovely word you use? Living what you're sort of ideating or yeah, you know, yeah. propagating. It's so hard. That's where. And that I think is really the, the final, I mean, the, the most uh, powerful example. Hindi me kete na okaat dik jati hai. That's mm -hmm. where. <laughs> and, you know, with younger feminists, especially, you can't say one thing and do another, you know, uh, because they're going to see it. They're going to see it perhaps even before you see the disjunction in your own life. You know, so um yeah and you know that this kind of thing also really irritates me. Yeah? Like why is the onus on us again? Again the onus is on us. You know like we are we are the ones who educate our sons. We are the ones who say our behavior has to match our ideals or our wishes. I don't hear other people actually saying that, you know? I mean, other than women, right? I don't hear men say it. I, I have yet to actually hear this become um, a loud enough chorus from, you know, um, 
non-binary and um, because I think also non-binary and all that it's in a very very young stage so everybody is still thinking about themselves you know my rights my oppression they they have not yet reached um, those sort of quantum moments where you you understand completely that solidarity is the only thing that's going to get you through this Solidarity as a word has disappeared from our vocabularies. How shocking is that? Yeah. No, Arshia. No, I don't believe that, you know, because the recently, I mean, what we saw in Delhi with the anti-CA yeah. movement yes, in Shahin yes, Mahab, the, CAA, course, the yeah. solidarities between the queer movement and the Dalit movement and the left movement and the uh, Muslim women's I movement. It, Oof, it was such a heady... Uh, I saw a little bit of that with the farmers' protest as well. Right? And yeah, a absolutely. very, very intersectional um, protest, yeah. really. Yeah. We're talking about these two movements have really brought a lot of my faith back. You know, yeah. I've really felt that there's something there, which uh, Naima, I completely take it, your point about grand campaigns leaving us a little cold at times, but. You know, I've been, Arsha, you I know I've been demonstrating since way before, but even I've been demonstrating since my college days in the 90s. And it's only because I'm older than you that I've been demonstrating longer but, than you. But you know, the multitudes that now come, yaar, us time pe to hum log so log hote the, and used to say, bhai, yaar, log a gaye. Mm-hmm. How to see the 10,000 people, you know, mujhe to pe, I feel like mainne to, I've had my gin and tonic, sorry, uh, Sabine, you know, I've, I'm on such a high, just to see the numbers, you know, so kuch abhi bhi hai. I don't want to be talking about the farmers movement, um, the, the, the women farmers were mobilized in a very organic manner, actually, they came together, because it was a question of their livelihood. It was a question of their family. And generally, you know, like historically, women have always been mobilized, you know, for, for their communities, you know, for the benefit of their communities, for their, you know, livelihood. The farmers movement was also a uh, very, you know, very organically, you know, it came about. And um, I remember, you know, uh, spending days there with the women. When I used to first go there, um, they were, you know, being mobilized, you know, they would get get up on the stage. In the beginning, they couldn't even speak. They couldn't, you know, they would just be standing there. And then, you know, slowly, you know, I saw that, you know, they, they, they felt the power of that stage. You know, they felt the power of people who are listening to them. And then, you know, they started speaking up. Towards the end, they were singing. And one thing, you know, that was very, very remarkable is that, you know, the when you think of a farmer, the image is of a man sitting on a tractor. And the women, you know, towards the end of that movement were saying that, you know, they all actually, a few of them learned how to, they all know how to ride a tractor, you know, because, you know, if you come from a farming family, you know to do everything. And they actually made it a point to drive those tractors because they realized that to get the recognition as farmers, and because, you know, farm work is considered as an extension of your reproductive la- labor, your household duties, household uh, chores, you know. And they realized that to be recognized as a farmer, they need to get up on that tractor. And it was such an organic way it happened. You know, you just, um, they were there. You know, there was a, you know, there was a threat to their livelihood. There was a, you know, all the men were out there. You know, they were camping there for so long. And the women started coming as well. In the beginning, you know, they were being brought, you know, they were being mobilized. And then after that, they, were, they started coming themselves. And the women who have come, uh, who went to those sites and went back home were not the same women. And this is this is how it happens, you know. Arpita, uh, uh, this reminds me. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, can I no, no, add? No, 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 excited. Go first. So I'm no, just no, no, go Sorry, uh, Sasha. Just one little no. thing. I really got excited when Nilanjana was speaking about the women farmers. I'm editing a book that we'll be bringing out soon called "Women of uh, People of India Say No to Nuclear Power," and all the essays in that book right, which are looking at Kudankalam, which is looking at Gorakhpur. Uh, so, of course, hardly anybody sitting in Delhi or we don't know about these because, you know, our papers will put it in page seven or something. All In all these essays, one of the things that comes out again and again is how all these pro- massive protests against the nuclear power plants 
were headed as much by women as by men. And, you know, I have been getting goosebumps editing this manuscript and learning about it. But, you know, also, you know, some of the longest running protests, you know, are being front, uh, you know, front, you know, like fronted by women. I mean, think about the Bhopal gas tragedy. Everybody has forgotten about it. The women have been, you know, fronting that battle, battle since 1984. I mean, amazing, you know, I mean, when, when women want to, you know, like do something and, you know, um, I, um, you know, spoke to uh, quite a lot, you know, like including, you know, some like Medha Patkar and all, and I, I asked, and, you know, she said something, you know, uh, you know, they all told me that, you know, when you want a movement to sustain, you bring the women in. Because they will, you know, like stand their ground. The men, you know, can be bribed, you know, they will lose interest after a while, they will, you know, leave, but the women will, you know, stand there. We saw that in Shaheen Bagh as well, right? You know, right. all the women, you know, I met there, you know, they were actually housewives. They were housewives, you know, one of them, I remember why one of them, almost all of them told me, we didn't have the courage to step out of our house after 9 p.m. Today, you know, we are going out alone, we are going out at all odd odd hours and and you know this is like yes you know they have now all gone back to their previous lives but you know they have not gone back the same women this is how you know organically it happens you you bring out a woman you know like from inside her house you know you you expose her to new experiences you know which could be anything you know which could be you know education or you know working or whatever you know or you know like a like a like a movement you know like a movement building or you know um, um, you know taking part in sit-ins and they go back feeling different and even if that doesn't you know like um, you know influence who they are it is definitely going to influence, you know, who their daughters are going to be. Sorry, I think I interrupted Sasha. She was saying something. Uh, I just wanted to say about the grassroots and this idea of an organic feminism. I, it's interesting because those women, then if you talk to them also, like I did development work with the National Rural Support Program in Pakistan, they're not going to turn around and say, yeah, we're feminists. They're not coming from this, fem like what Naima was saying, this massive ha, feminist movement. But it's these, uh, this is what I meant earlier about the development model that is the true feminism and it doesn't even need to be called the feminism and the women don't even need to be saying hum feminist hai. but the action the action okay. i feel like feminism in its essence is a body in revolt you see or 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 in resistance and i saw this in my work in the gowns and there was this woman full niqab kanis fat uh, kanis fatma i think her name was and she was heading out fully, you know, immersing in environment, making money, um, the first woman in the family. But it was interesting in her. So she wasn't saying my feminist, too, but she was feminist. That was her, 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 her nature. But uske case mein, it was interesting because I said it turned out it was her father. Her father was the one. You see, sometimes these men can surprise. It was the, you see, if they support the woman, and they allow her to. So her feminism came from the patriarchy not behaving as the patriarchy does. Father and then husband also supported this, you know, act of pure feminism, organic feminism. Um, you were talking about the farmers, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, the, the farmers movement, sorry about that, spaced out for a bit. Um, and it uh, reminded me, Arpita, of a group Sandhu. Uh, we had a pre recorded session, The Power of illust uh, Illustrated Storytelling. And she showed me her work from last year. She had created this amazing uh, uh, image of uh, two women sitting on a tractor. Nilanjana, you, you, you were talking about that. And how accepting that was you know everyone embraced that image because there, there were these two demure looking women uh sitting on a tractor and it was embraced um but it also uh you know on on the flip side uh you were talking again talking about these protests the arab spring or the the, the revolution in sudan um you know 
it sort of, you know, it started as an inclusive uh, movement and it was eventually, should I say sabotaged? I don't know. Uh, so does, you know, India seeing all these amazing, you know, positive sides of these protests, um, does it have anything to do with being multicultural? Maybe, I don't know. I feel very worried. I don't know how long we're going to be multicultural. Yeah, I mean, look at the speed yeah. with which things are changing, with which people are taking sides in a most partisan manner. Um, uh, and the Arab Spring, you're right. I mean, it was, you know, it started somewhere else, it went somewhere else, but at the same time, a lot happened, which is also memorable, but a lot happened, which is unfortunate. Um, I mean, right now, for instance, I feel like I'm learning every day from the Muslim students in Karnataka and the way they're fighting, you know, for their right to go to educational institutions wearing the hijab. I, I feel like, you know, the way they are fighting a situation where, I mean, they're not in big cities, they don't have uh, the power of sort of the media behind them. If anything, the television media has been uh, actually painting them in the worst kind of uh, sort of, you know, uh, way. And these um, are the young women that we imagine we have to take feminism to. That's rubbish. You know, absolutely. I mean, it is, as Sasha was saying, it's something, I, I don't know about organic, but it's something inherent. It's something, yeah. you know. Or as you said, Asha, let's leave the adjectives. You know? I'm, I'm let's just call them the labeling. Yeah. Yeah. Feminisms, you know, that yeah. really because, yeah. yeah. Because the more we make adjectives, the more differences we find. Okay, I am this and not that, you know. Exactly. I'm a Muslim feminist, I'm not an Indian feminist. I'm an Indian feminist, Muslim, but you know, because it's just always on the boil. So. I think our, our uh, thanks to the left parties, you know, I think um, our grassroots mobilization has always been very strong. So, um, and, um, you know, self-help groups, they have played and- But the left has betrayed women in India like nobody no, else no, no, no. I, 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 I agree not, with that. <laughs> I no longer support the left. No, they have, have, but really? I'm just saying that the networks they built and, uh, you know, combined to that, the self-help groups, you know, they have really economically empowered women. They have given women, um, you know, like a sense of sisterhood. I'm talking about the, uh, you know, self-help groups. I'm not just talking about, you know, the left parties. You can disagree with me on that. But I think, you know, they created a network that still works. You know, like I, I know my friends, you know, who work, you know, like absolutely at the grassroots levels, you know, who are... I mean, who are doing amazing job, you know, like people like Kavita Krishnan and all, you know, they, they do an amazing job. So I don't think, you know, we can um, just outright cancel them, you know, I mean, yes, you know, like. Well, not um, at all. Yeah. No cancelling, but please, mm -hmm. like, I mean, let's not give praise where praise is not due. I Kavita think... Krishnan is spectacular. She is a miracle. Yeah, her male colleagues, <laughs> I'm not sure I can say that. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying that, you know, I mean, there are always exceptions. And, and I think, you know, in today's world, you know, I don't think, you know, we can actually, you know, um, give credit to a single group for anything that is happening. You know, there are always, you know, individual heroes, you know, who are, no, sorry, the heroes is a wrong term to use, you know, individual people, you know, who are doing, you know, amazing work. So, you know, I mean, like, and, and Kavita obviously doesn't work on her own, you know, she has an entire, you know, like, you know, a group of people, you know, who work with her. So I'm just saying that, you know, um, it's um, not, um, it's not as black and white as that, you know, I mean, like that, that's my personal opinion, you're absolutely free to disagree with that. But also, you know, like, I think, you know, the grassroots mobilization, you know, like, um, for the farmers movement, you know, it was actually all the, you know, like the left groups, you know, who actually mobilized the women farmers to come to the Angela, I would like to differ on that a little bit. I think uh, a lot of the farmers movement grew out of their own sense of how, uh, you know, uh, uh, their livelihoods, their lives, their entire wajood was being uh, challenged. And this wasn't anything new as no, that, we know, that's so, not but for decades. 
And no, I don't know, that's not true though. That's not true because I, you know, like uh, extensively. I tell you something. If I, if you just let me complete what I'm saying, um, the book that I was currently editing that I'm currently editing, one of the essays talks about how um, the Gorakhpur nuclear power plant project uh, protest, which was entirely farmer led, and some left parties, of course, descended there in order to help them so-called mobilize. Once the farmers left the movement, right? Nobody could bring it back. Nobody could make anything happen. The left parties on their own did not come back. Nobody was there to bring that movement against nuclear power back. Once the farmers had left, knowing that it was not going to change for them. So I don't, I, I, I you know, if you are saying that the farmers were made aware by the left parties, they had no idea on their own um, uh, that they that they had the left parties not been there to do the mobilizing work. No, that. Then what are you saying? No, I'm just saying that they played an important role in mobilizing a lot of the farmers. There were, of course, you know, other you know groups that were working on the ground as well. But you know, you are actually you, just you know credit the communities. Themselves. Yeah, you you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. I'm not you know I'm not praising the left parties. You know, I'll I'll give you, you a very that actually, no. I just that say that no. I just say that they have built a mobilization network that comes in handy, you know, during this movement. So now, the RSS that, actually, yeah. Sorry? The RSS has built an amazing We know what the, I, mean, I don't know where the RSS I know Bengali as well, as well and we know the, what the left thing, but, uh, listen, We I'll, know I'll, what I'll, the I'll, left did to women in Shingum. No, no, uh, absolutely. absolutely. No, you know, Every, I know Bengali listen, as well. I yeah. live in Noida and, you know, there was once, you know, this entire thing, you know, like about, you know, like maids being called, you know, like Bangladeshis and there was a huge thing. So I, I was, you know, like helping um, the, the domestic workers, you know, to uh, sort of, you know, uh, organize and, you know, like uh, the, 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 there was a lot of police atrocity and everything. And when, you know, everything was done. You know, I almost got shot by the police and everything and everything was done. We had, you know, like, um, you know, uh, managed to um, get the girl, you know, they were holding, they were, they were just holding this domestic worker, you know, in one of the um, apartment complexes. Suddenly, you know, uh, the <laughs> representatives of two, you know, uh, left unions just come there and they are like now trying to take this, these people for a protest. And I'm like, you know, they are, you know, that the police will pick them up. Where were you, you know, all this time, you know, the, uh, uh, there were two weeks had passed, you know, when these people were picked up by the police. And, you know, I was like in the police station, like at 2.30 in the night, you know, like with my husband, you know, trying to just, you know, like, you know, make sure that, you know, um, just standing outside, not being able to do anything you know nobody would help us but then you know when everything was done they came so i am agreeing with you that you know they have you know but but what you are saying i'm agreeing with you all i'm saying is that they have created a network which you know like is being used by people like kavita right i mean you know you said that you know she's doing an amazing job but you know she comes from a left background her ideology is you know you know comes from that background so i'm just saying that you know they still you know like they play an important role you know um, you know they played an important role in mobilizing the women farmers you know during the farmers movement so i mean I, I spoke to a lot of them you know and they were like they were all you know from you know like left unions and all of that so all i'm saying is that there are a lot of factors you know that are coming together you know to 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 mobilize these groups you know it's not like um just one thing that's all i'm saying you know i'm not you know like really saying you know that you know that left parties we must credit the left parties with everything and yes you know uh, the rss also organizes well although i don't see the relevance of that in this discussion but you know all see, i'm saying is no, that there are no, a lot the of relevance problems. is that Ashi was saying that we talk about organizing there are many people who organize so that that's what she was that's the, yeah, but the, the discussion is involved. not about the uh, the right wing organization here right now so that's mm -hmm. why i'm saying that all i was saying was that there are different ways of mobilizing people there are different groups who are doing that maybe you know nobody is doing it perfectly but there are different groups who are doing it that's all i was trying to say uh one thing i wanted to you know we we spoke about cancel culture as well um so and you know, it is something that is perhaps democratizing, uh, you know, what we uh, put out there and, you know, 
uh, there's freedom of expression and it holds people accountable but you know it also gives power and when it comes to social media you know uh, masses you know and you talk about masses you know they, this power inadvertently falls into perhaps the wrong hand uh look at jk rowling's i uh, i'm not saying that she what she said was right or wrong but uh, how would you comment on that uh, she to be called out <laughs> sorry but she yeah no 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 that's fine like, that's fine my my point is uh you know cancel cu culture vis-a-vis -vis its uh, you know feminism and its impact on feminism uh anyone i don't know how disagreement led to cancel I honestly don't know that. I mean, there is dissent, there is disagreement, there is argument, there is hatapai, sabkuch hota hai. So, cancel kaise ban gaya? How do you tell somebody else, whoever they are, that exactly. you have the right to speak? Exactly. That is just beyond me completely. I, I cannot understand the steps that got us there. So that's I've what seen it, uh, so, sorry. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry. I, I've just seen the consequences i don't know what it's like sort of in india on the social media scene because of course now we don't get access to specific geographic zones um but i've seen what damage it's done to a lot of female identifying women um who have lost their livelihood they've lost their there was a poet uh, this spoken word poet in scotland and, you know, she said something on Twitter, which may or may not be whatever it is, judge, jury, executioner sort of system. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not fully, you see, this is what I was talking about earlier. I, I really mistrust this, this, this perpetuation of hatred between the trans uh, 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 segments. I, I really mistrust it. And I feel like it's, there's something sinister, frankly, uh, because how did we get to the point where we're making death, death threats against the female uh, identifying woman? You know, I don't get it. That is sinister to me. So there, and they've so many have lost out everything that let's say feminism has fought for. So yeah. I, I, I myself, I'm not sure about the cancel culture in the terms of this. How and of course, there's been a huge backlash. There's, you know, uh, female identifying women are, you know, fighting back against ke, like <clears throat> the toilets, for example. You know, the toilets that but I just wonder, like, how did we get to toilets? Like, why are toilets so important, frankly? Because trans women feel unsafe going into men's toilets. And they're yeah, not attack, this they're is not a controversial. I get That's it. This is a, this is a controversial all. subject. Uh, I don't you think know. it is. No, I think it is. I think it is when there are different views. Death threats against uh, trans women as well, not just See, death threats. Cool. I, I think everyone should okay. have a safe space. Yeah. Ye nahi ke Sabko, oh, so trans... send a neutral toilet. That's the thing. That Just happens. build more toilets. We need build them for our Why are we fighting about toilets? That's a very first world uh, solution, no? Our India may come on. Ah, exactly. Our India may come on. India may come on. India may come on. What are the trans women going to do here? Who are getting raped by the policemen all the time? For, say, who are giving doing sexual favors for policemen all the time? They're not interested. In you know, you know, Arpita. Uh, I read just read today there was this huge party uh, at a very prestigious um, institute in Pakistan, and it was you know, and it went viral because of the the anger uh, it triggered because it was allegedly a gay party. So you know, in a country which is phobia in every sense of the word, which has phobia, all kinds of phobias, you know, even, you know, toilet to bohat hi dur ki baat hai. <laughs> toilet so banana exactly. bhi. But Sabine, for the person on the street, no, no, you're right. toilet Man, is the first thing. Exactly, toilet exactly. Is the access to toilets is the first thing. Exactly. And the fact is that this perception of female identifying women, that trans women are, are out to harm them when they share toilets yeah. with them, 
I don't know where this has come from. No, but listen, why is it so wrong to listen if they are afraid? Ke har ek ke fears ko address karo na, unke bhi fears, why is it so uh, wrong? But the question that many people have been, uh, queer feminists have been asking is, you answer this question, na, ye fear kahan se aaya hai ki trans women aapko attack karenge? गेटकीपिंग that they were uh, calling men out f- uh, at one time for now that tra- this is the unlearning i was talking about in the beginning ha ah, but the i think you, are already, you are already ahead you are already ahead but the feminism that i see that tries to cancel and all this you know they are not as up uh, up uh, you're ahead and i agree with you on this i just feel what's happening like in the west and all this is not gone that far yet it's still in the in the trenches like mud slinging and hurt and everyone's fears are not accepted and that really upsets me you know that why can we not listen to everyone's fears the gay man the trans woman the trans, trans woman fears too yeah. you know trans woman's fear exactly and everyone's fears and of course we can't make everyone bloody toilets <laughs> you're right it is a western privileged elitist sort of thing har ek ko toilets job now i mean people are squatting on the side of the road in india and pakistan to you know we don't have that but my big thing is just that you how can you this is why i want to be in the middle like as a me as a as a as switzerland i want to just say ke dekho no, no, agar no. unko dar hai to unka dar address karo unko apni jagah de do don't force things on anybody that's all i think um mere khayal mein when we uh solution ki taraf jo hai wo questions ke saath jaye to wo difficult hota hai i think everyone should bring their opinions to the table uh, simply uh, i don't know uh, uh, what uh, i am a novice at this lekin uh, wahi baat hai ki empathy ke sath uh, and maybe main apni privilege se baat kar rahi hai i don't know magar uh, you know, i think empathy badi zaruri hai across the board and that's that's how you begin um uh, but yeah uh, these are very difficult questions and questions need to be answered by answers not questions maybe uh, i don't know um, but i think it's a good start i think uh, ye conversation itni warm and enlightening or fascinating i think uh, yeah yeah i love every minute of it because this is how you know we go forward and this this is the learning we were talking about in the first place uh jab tak dhamaka nahi hoga magic won't be created so so thank you so much everyone and this is not the end because uh, uh i think we need another session uh Boss. so 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 please be ready i'm going to bug each and every one of you <laughs> arpita yeah. knows that arshia is coming to know that uh, so is uh, naima and lanjana and sasha um, so so uh, i think another round of this conversation is much needed to rediscover what feminism is all about to rediscover what you know uh, everything is about i'm not again i, I am so opposed to labeling and tagging i think hona ek had tak hona chahiye but you know at the end of it all of us you know having a conversation uh, which is important to move forward thank you everyone naima arshia arpita nandana sasha uh, maine uh, sabke screen se big, big thanks to you and ananke uh, as a conversation mere ek do saal mein to zoom pe nahi hua hai jo aaj hua hai itna maza aaya really to 
be able to speak in such an engaged manner and to agree and disagree and agree to disagree and really sisters this has been amazing no i just yeah. wish but we painfully short to sabine painfully short yeah, aap yeah, humein chhed ke ghante baad aapne khuda ko kar diya this is not warm up to i ab to warm up exactly yeah, yeah, exactly this, yeah, this is exactly. the appetizer <laughs> session abhi main course aur dessert sab kuch pada hai don't worry i'm going to uh, you know have another session so once you're in there's no going out <laughs> thank you thank you everyone thank you. bye bye thank you, you sabine and thank you anarke bye bye